Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Yale. Yale Adelaide, uh, great to see you, Yale. I hope, uh, really looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, uh, Yale, uh, a fellow adoptee, you were born in uh, Romania. So, you're uh, an international uh, adoptee. And uh, today, we're going to be talking about navigating navigating reunion from that uh, in, in that context in the context of a, an international uh, adoption and what you've learned along that uh, along that uh, curve so um, I think the first thing that you, you you talked about last time we spoke was the was the kind of the um, the uh, the overthinking, the, the the mind racing, the all the questions, all the questions going round in your head, and all that. So, t- tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I think you know it's very easy to overthink things when there are so many unknowns, and I think that's something that all adoptees can probably relate to and understand. That when you know your mind kind of can go in so many different directions when you just don't have the answers that you're looking for or that you need or feel that you need. And naturally, um, you know, I was in that same position where I had a lot of questions. And I think, you know, growing up, I was kind of indifferent about my adoption because I wasn't yet ready to explore it. But, you know, around my 30th birthday, I would say, was the time that I I felt ready to uh, dig a little bit deeper into my past and kind of fill in those missing blanks uh, of my adoption journey. And so I started to really take those steps to find those answers um, of questions that I had. And, you know, I think over time, what I, what I realized was that it was great to get some answers, but there are always going to be questions that we have uh, that we're not going to get the answers to. And I think that was just something that was kind of like an aha moment that I had. And it kind of brought on a level of acceptance for me, um, which I I think was important because I I finally just accepted that I'm not always going to get all of the answers that I'm looking for. And that's okay. Yeah. We're not very good, are we, at at dealing with uncertainty? Like whether we're adopted or not adopted, it's just like when we're a bit, I think we learn we learn to be afraid of uncertainty. We're always looking to n- nail things, um, nail things down. And we, uh, speaking for myself, you know, I, for we somehow I've got on. I've got uh, the idea in life that overthinking is actually going to help me answer stuff, right? And it, it it doesn't really do that, does it? It it it, it just. Yeah, I'm a little bit better at that than, than I think I, I, I used to be. But whether I've got to the point that you're at about acceptance or not, I don't, I, I don't know. But I, I was in, I was indifferent. I was indifferent as well. Um, one of the things I've heard from lots of other people is that women tend to be more curious about the past, about the the origins, um, than, uh, and than 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 than. Uh, blokes as as a mass generalization um so mm-hmm. so yeah so that the, uh, you had a an acceptance when you realized that you weren't going to get every question answered and did that happen w- w- when in your when in the journey did that happen did that happen after the after the re- reunion when do you remember when that that aha moment was yeah, I think it was leading up to it. Uh, you know, I I kind of had, there were a lot of moving parts and, you know, I had the opportunity to actually track down my birth mother yeah. and we had a conversation prior to the actual reunion itself because the reunion was in Romania. So that required yeah. me traveling a bit um, and, and doing that. But prior to that, you know, the private investigator that I hired um, to track her down kind of uh, coordinated this conversation. And it was the first time that I saw my birth mother on, um, it was a, just a FaceTime video yeah. call and he was translating the conversation because she doesn't speak English. 
And, you know, it was just kind of in that moment, I think, um, when I first saw her that things changed for me overall. Um, but I would say in terms of, you know, kind of having that acceptance that, you know, I, I'm not going to always get all of my answers. Um, but that was okay because at that moment, uh, you know, it was more important for me to really get a sense for who she was as a person and, and not just, you know, like, Oh, who is she? What does she look like seeing somebody, but really getting a sense for her character and, uh, what kind of a person she was. Yeah. So it was more fundamental. It was the essence of her. Yes, yeah. exactly. It was, it was the, es the, the essence of her. Y you also talked, so how long ago was this, Yale? This was, I want to say, almost three years ago now. Wow. 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 It's, not, it's still relatively new then, yeah? It's still yes. relatively new, yeah. So when did you start writing the book? Because the, 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 the book must have, like a couple of years ago, how, when did you start writing the book? Yeah, my book came out actually in uh, 2020. My book oh. from Gypsy to Jersey. Um, it was really critical for me to actually have it be released in that year for reasons that I go into uh, in my book and tying in ABC 2020 and Barbara Walters and all of these people that uh, kind of played a role in my adoption journey and broadcasting what was going on in Romania at the time of yeah. my adoption. So you you also talked about um, the uh, the uh, empathy for your uh, empathy empathy for your your birth mother and uh, and how there was a cultural context for that as well. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? That sound that sounded like it was a big uh, big area for for you that was kind of unexpected, was it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we all going back to kind of having all of those unknowns. Um, you, we kind of, at least for me, I think I, um, I don't want to say I like vilified her in my head, but you know, you, I, I guess I wondered, you know, what kind of person she was um, to put me up for adoption, uh, especially I have a half sister, a birth half sister as well, uh, who was not put up for adoption. So that was kind of, um, you know, a new element that I was exposed to and, you know, just really understanding, you know, how she could have came to that decision. And, you know, um, it was really, it was, it was something difficult to kind of wrap my head around and understand. But I think when I met her and I, and I saw just her demeanor, the way she spoke, um, I, I believe that people give off a certain energy and she just, she gave off this really kind hearted, sweet energy. And I, I don't believe that she has a mean bone in her body. <laughs> I really, she just seemed like a really beautiful person. And I, and I, I sensed that immediately after just speaking with her a few moments and it just kind of put things into perspective for me. And then also taking into account the, uh, the historical backdrop that I mentioned, uh, you know, communist Romania and what was going on at the time. And just thinking about how extreme circumstances can really lead you to take some extreme action. And so things kind of just came together for me as I further did my research and further made these connections. Um, and I, and I did, I, I, I still do, I still do feel, um, somewhat empathetic for her, uh, especially with the cultural element involved. Uh, you know, I was born, uh, Roma, um, which is synonymous with the word gypsy. I like to use the word Roma because it's a little bit more politically correct or traveler, um, for those outside the, uh, Roma community. Um, so I like to use that, that terminology, but, you know, just having that cultural aspect there too, uh, where family is so important um, and they have very large families and very strong family connections. And I think, you know, she was really looked down upon for her decision um, and she had to live with that. And there were just between the cultural aspects and the historical aspects. Um, I did, I did, I did kind of uh, feel empathetic for her. Yeah. So it sounds like, before the is you're very much in your head about this um with all the the questions but 
when you you met her, it it was you were you kind of move into a heart space. So it was about the the kind of the details didn't matter. The exactly. answering the questions didn't matter. It was more like you sank into like a a, a heart space to get a connection with her. Yeah, I did, and 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 I felt very connected to her, even though she was you know essentially a stranger to me. Uh, I was adopted at the age of two. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know anything about her. We didn't speak the same language. Um, you know, I felt like she was a complete stranger. And yet I did. I did feel um, not on the video chat, but when we actually when it was time for a reunion and I met her in person, I did feel this strange level of of closeness and connectedness to her. Um, that was very apparent to me. Yeah. And, and it, it can't have been easy with the. Uh... The, the language barrier. I I know I my so my sister is married. Well, sorry, my sister she she wasn't married actually, but she was with this guy for for donkey's years in um, in um, uh, Switzerland. She got three kids with him. I think she was with him for about fifteen years, something like that. She got she's got three. She, she has three kids, and they're all in their twenties now. Um, and she 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 and her partner spoke French around the house, so the kids didn't pick up English till later on. Right. And when I saw that, when the, the kids came, uh, kids came over to see, you know, my mum and dad, their grandparents, the, the language barrier was, was there, you know, but they've known them since they were, well, well forever, you know? Um, so it, it, it must've been that, that, you know, having a, Having a translator, you had the, the the private investigator, and I think you said, I think we said last, I think you said last time that uh, did did you did, did you half did you half sister did she she do some translation as well? Is that right? Is it so? How my half sister and I communicate is we uh, use like I translate and tools like that, but she doesn't speak English. No, she doesn't uh, speak. English. All right, okay, so I got that. So what you you've got these different ways of overcoming the language barrier um yes but it must have been it, it must have been tricky with that the interpreter there you know like yeah so how, how did it feel that yeah i mean especially with reunion i mean reunion is such a a personal uh an emotional experience to begin with um you're really overwhelmed with different emotions and different things happening at the same time. Um, a lot is going on during your reunion and language barrier definitely doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was difficult to connect because it's not like I could just have a conversation like you and I are having, um, you know, it was, it was very difficult having that translator, uh, you know, kind of, just directing all of the conversation and, and filling in the, the silences and, and all of that. So it definitely was, um, it was different than, than how I would like it to be. Uh, and I, and I sensed my birth mother and other, uh, birth, uh, family members experiencing that same frustration because we just want to be able to talk to each other. Uh, and we can't, and especially now, uh, you know, my birth mother, she doesn't speak English. She can't read or write. Um, so I can't even talk to her via phone. Uh, thankfully I can communicate with my birth sister and we can uh, send messages back to back and forth with one another using, you know, translation tools and she can get a message to my birth mother and vice versa, but it, it definitely makes it more challenging. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how, how do you, you talked about this, this notion of your, your birth identity. What's, what's that been? Tell, tell us about that. What's that been like? So I grew up, my parents always told me that I was adopted from early on, uh, but they gave me very, uh, a very general story. They didn't really disclose all of the pieces to my adoption. Uh, but one thing they were open about was, you know, that I was born in Romania and, and my birth mother, um, you know, put me up for adoption. I lived in the house with her, which, um, you know, I wasn't in an orphanage setting and, you know, it was a, just a very plain generic story. So I always just went on thinking, okay, I'm Romanian. A part of me is Romanian. That's my birth country and thinking in that way. 
But when I came to uh, doing some research and learning more about my story and uncovering my my Roma roots, um, it really just added a whole new dimension to everything because now, okay, so I'm not really Romanian. That's not really you know, my birth identity at all. My birth identity is really now Roma. And like, what does that even mean? And, you know, more questions uh, stemmed from that realization. And, you know, I, I did more research and I tried to just absorb what I could about the Roma people. And um, it was really fascinating to me about how uh, culturally different, you know, my life would have been had I been raised in the Roma community. So there was, there was those thoughts that I had. And then, you know, what I came to realize was I really wanted to try to connect with my birth identity. And because I, I, I found that it brought me a sense of comfort, uh, a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment when I was doing something and learning something Roma, or it's listening to a podcast um, or, you know, connecting with an organization that advocates for Roma people, or even just something simple like listening to a Roma song or reading a book by uh, an author who's Roma or Romani. So little things like that, I, I realized was really important because I think um, that your birth identity really matters. It's always a piece of who you are. Um, so I, I I enjoy doing that. Yeah. Connecting with that. I mean, we you mentioned this um, fact that you'd lived with her for two years. Um, that that have made must have made it really tricky for her. You know, I've heard stories about um, babies being taken away. You know, if mothers have been knocked out on, on drugs, I'm going back a you know a, a long time ago here. You know, um, but in, in, perhaps in the in the sixties, birth mothers not knocked out with drugs and not not seeing their baby and uh, th this idea that um the sooner the the, the sooner the, the the birth mother and the baby are, are separated the better it's going to be for the birth mother and uh, or both presumably um and, and then you've got this your own situation with living with her for 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 two years. She must have, like, yeah. Have you ever? I think about, yeah, I think about that a lot, especially being a parent myself. I have three little ones, so I I think about that a lot, uh, especially just as they grow older and seeing the different milestones they reach and just the just the overall uh, attachment that exists uh, when they're little, especially around the age of two. Uh, so as I've watched my kids grow up and as they're still in it, I, I kind of hold a really special place for that age of two because that's the age I was when I was put up for adoption. And I think of all the times when my kids are just, you know, saying, mommy, mommy, and they're like clinging at my hip. And I think of what that attachment uh, was when I was a little girl living in Romania with her and how how she was able to make that really difficult decision. Yeah. Have you actually, obviously you're going to have to do this through the translator or the apps and stuff like that. Have you, have you raised that subject with her or, or is it, is it too sensitive, too difficult? With my birth mother talked yeah. about, uh, our living situation. No, I, I, you know, I, it was very painful for her to kind of relive yeah. uh, ever really. And there are things that she doesn't even remember, but I, I know for sure that part of the reason why that I lived with her was, you know, she really was trying to make our living situation work. Right. And, and that makes sense because if she wasn't, she could have, you know, we, she could have said her goodbyes at the hospital as soon as she had me, or she could have put me uh, in an orphanage. She could have made an array of decisions that she didn't make, but she really tried to make it work. And I believe that, um, you know, through her decision to try to raise me for two years. Uh, my birth father, though, was uh, very abusive. He abused alcohol. He physically abused her. And it wasn't. Uh, a safe 
environment for me to be living in. She also uh, had no money and it was a very big financial strain uh, due to a lot of the circumstances that was going on in the country at the time. So I, I know that, you know, she tried to make it work and it just, it became, it became too difficult for her to take care of herself, let alone a child. Yeah. So it's, it's been to, uh, you, you've got some broad brushes, strokes of it, but it's been too, too painful, as you say, really to, to go. To, to go near near that so perhaps yeah, I'm being a bit intrusive yeah. here as well I'm just like yeah it's a no, tough that's one. okay I you know I think too it, it, and it goes back to you know not having all the answers and and recognizing that that's okay because I don't I don't want to torture her at the same no. time you know I don't want to I don't need to put her through so much uh emotional distress you know, the time that I want to have with her, the conversations that I want to have with her are, you know, I want them to be pleasant and I want to create memories for us uh, that, you know, lend themselves to being positive and, uh, you know, just, you know, things in that light. So I, I don't want, I don't want to go there every single time I interact with her, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. I was talking to uh, an, another adoptee in, uh, who's in reunion um, and uh, there was a point, this is, if people listen to it, um, it's with uh, with Daniel Godet. Um, she, there was a point at which her, her birth mother said, could we not talk about adoption anymore? Something like that. It's like, you know, we've, we've done this. We've done this to death, you know, like <laughs> it's time to, it's time to move on. Um, and, uh, but obviously she, she was able to, this was a um, a domestic adoption, you know. So two people that speak the same language. Um, did I, I'm I'm curious on the language thing. Did did the language sound familiar at all to you? Because you must you must have heard it in the first two years of your life, right? Did your mother's voice sound familiar, or the language sound familiar, or anything? Was was it all was it all a fresh? Was it all brand new? I think it was all new to me, uh, but I did have the knowledge that my parents shared with me that, you know, at the age of two, I was speaking some words of Romanian and then also Romani, which is the language of the Roma people. So it was kind of interesting that, you know, I had all of these different languages that I, I did speak to some extent as a little child. Um, and I would, and that's actually something that I would love to learn. I would, I would love to learn at the very least Romanian, um, to a point where I can be somewhat conversational, if not Romani, um, just to kind of further my connection. Yeah. yeah, but none of it's come back at all. No, no. I have actually no recollection whatsoever of yeah. anything um, from that time. That time. Um, I just I, I I spent some time in um, in in Germany and but hadn't spoken it for for ages, but it comes back fairly quickly. But you know. I wasn't two, so you know, it's, it's a whole different <laughs> ball game. Yeah, whole different ball game. So, uh, how would you how would you describe the before and after from a kind of a, a big a big picture take uh, uh, emotionally from? So you started off, uh, you said not particularly interested, indifferent towards the adoption, and then the, uh, and then the question started coming, and there was this. You felt this desire to 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 um, to, to reconnect, getting all their commissioning the the private investigator. What was it look like the before and after to you? How does that work? Yeah, all of those things that you mentioned leading up to it. Um, you know, nobody can prepare you for reunion. You have a lot of. Uh, I really tried not to set too many expectations because I I didn't want to set myself up for disappointment. I didn't want to, I really didn't want to set a bar at all. <laughs> I really just wanted to experience it and, and really, um, you know, just, just see what it's like and, and just kind of start with a, a clean slate. And, you know, I, I don't regret anything from my reunion trip. I, I, I'm just so glad that I took the opportunity to actually go there and, and make that, make that trip to Romania and have the chance to, 
speak to my birth mother face to face and meet my birth sister and the other relatives. And, you know, obviously after reunion, there's the before, there's the during, and then there's the after. So there's a lot to unpack and process following uh, reunion. To this day, even though it was a few years ago now, I still have moments where I just have these random reflections from that trip. Uh, whether it be something that happened or something that somebody said. Uh, and that's that's going to stay with me forever. But I think all in all, I'm really grateful that I I made that trip. Mm-hmm. And, and did you, as you were growing up, you talked about being feeling in, indifferent to, to, to and, and I was, I was the same. I just, just wasn't interested at all. Um, now some people jump on that and say, oh, you were in denial and, know people can and different opinions and stuff like that did did were you um did did the to what extent did the uh, the the reunion help you uh, heal was i mean w- bef- before reunion was there uh I, I described this as the um i described my own primal wound uh as a paper cut right compared to somebody else feels like a, a bite out of their leg by um, by a great white shark, right? And there's a, a, all those different things in between them. And then at the real extremes, some people that I speak to, um, it, it feels like it, it's it's like um, um, Mel Gibson in Braveheart at the end of Braveheart when he's hung, drawn, and quartered, right? So this is the that's the really hard, the the really tough stuff. The people that have been through. Um, where were you on where where were you on that um uh, on on that that spectrum did you did you feel did you well, i think i felt relief i think i felt uh a really just big sense of relief uh you know when i got on that plane uh departing from romania as i was heading home I think, you know, there's, there's just so much uh, anxiety and like so many feelings that are happening leading up to that trip. And I think it was just, it was like, oh, I can breathe now. Um, You know, I, I was, I was really glad that I met everyone and I, it was, it was a risk, you know, you you always risk um, not knowing how people are going to act towards you, how welcoming they're going to be, how, uh, you know, what, just how they're gonna kind of process the reunion on their own. And, you know, I, I was very lucky in that way. They really, it was it was like a celebration. They literally got a cake for me. They ha- they showered me with presents. Uh, you know, they, it was like, they, they literally kept saying like Adriana, which is my Romanian birth name, Adriana has returned home. And that's how they phrased it. So it was very, um, it was a really beautiful, trip and it was very emotional uh seeing how everybody went out of their way for me to try to get to know me and connect with me and um you know I guess it was it was bittersweet because I wanted to I wanted to stay longer I wanted to have the opportunity to get to know these people more and I think going back to those uh you know international barriers that exist you know there's always going to be uh things that get in the way of that you know I'm in a unique situation where both parties kind of want to stay connected and stay, uh, they want to stay close to some degree and get to know each other and uh, connect further. And we can't really do that. So, you know, that was kind of the bitter side to that. But at the same time, it was nice knowing that these people are here and there are ways to communicate. Um, And, you know, you just have to get a little creative and think outside the box, but it's doable. And, you, you know, life is short. And, you know, if I can make the most of these moments and the relationships that I have, I think it's worth it. Yeah, yeah. So you were, you were, I, I've perhaps I've missed, I've underestimated how revved up you were before the trip. It was it, it, yes. it, describing it was a, a, a relief. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Talk about getting in your head. I, I was definitely in my head a great deal leading up to the trip. Um, you know, over just silly things. It was, it was around like the holidays and uh, it was around December and, and 
Christmas and all these different holidays. And I was, <laughs> I was like, Oh God, I'm going to this country. Like I have to get gifts for everybody. What am I going to get these people? You know, like silly things like that. I would, I would just overthink and uh, you know, I would just play out different crazy things in my head and uh, just needing to know all of the details and all of the arrangements and how are we going to do this? And it was a lot, you know, it's not like you're traveling uh, domestically. I'm I'm literally hopping on a plane <laughs> for seven, eight hours, traveling to a foreign country for the first time by myself. So yes, it was, it was definitely, um, it was a wild trip. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, has it, 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 there's a relief after it and uh, overall, has it, it, how's it added to your life, do you, do you feel? I feel honestly like I have extended family in a way. Um, you know, they've, they've kind of in my mind, I've kind of um, compartment, uh, just made it like they are just these extended relatives that kind of, exist in my life in a way. So that's kind of how I've rationalized it. And, you know, I really do enjoy speaking to my birth sister. Uh, I enjoy hearing from her. And even if it's just little, little messages back and forth, you know, she, she always texts me uh, sister in like everything she says. So she'll be like, good morning, sister. How are you? <laughs> so hearing that is very comforting and sweet. And, um, you know, they're just, they're, they're really great people. Yeah. And uh, I'm very lucky that I had the chance to meet them and that I can continue to uh, stay somewhat in contact with them. Yeah. Have you got much in common with you, your half sister? Say that again, I'm sorry. Have you got much in common? Do you feel you've oh, got do I have Um, well, I definitely think the resemblance is there, which is uh, always something that, I feel like adoptees think about, um, you know, seeing the resemblance between myself and my birth mother and even my birth sister was kind of uh, uncanny. You definitely can see a resemblance there. I think we definitely come from two different worlds. Yeah. Um, the Roma culture is vastly different from, you know, how I live uh, my day-to-day -day life. Um, but I think what, what kind of does keep us aligned is really this idea of family and the important role that family plays. And I think we definitely have some similar values um, in terms of that. So I, I would say that's probably where we, we, we have the most in common. And if she got kids? She does. Yes. She has four kids. Yeah. Who I got to meet on. All right. And have, have the, have your kids and her kids had any, and anything to do with it so on, on zoom calls or or facebook or anything like that have you kept no they haven't met yet um my birth mother did meet my um my oldest daughter on a on the facetime call um but at that point i hadn't even really had the conversation with her about adoption in general or my background and uh that actually was more of like a recent development having that conversation with her but my kids are really little. My oldest is only seven, and then oh, I have right. a four-year-old and two-year-old. Yeah. So they're, yeah. they're very little. <laughs> what about your adoptive? Sorry, but yeah. What about your parents? Your mum and dad. Your adoptive parents. How's that been? Yeah, my mother lives close to me, and my father uh, passed away a few years ago. Um, you know, I was really close with him, so that was difficult. Um, you know, my mother and I have kind of a complex relationship and I think that was also that kind of played into uh meeting my birth mother uh and connecting with my birth mother and and seeing thinking about you know what that relationship would have been like uh was another piece for me um and just kind of seeing the person she was and all of that so I always thought of that and you know would I have a different relationship you know had I grown up there uh or or, or something like that yeah yeah so um we we talked about this this idea of a healing curve um mm -hmm. last time i mean what does that what does that mean to you i mean you talked about numbing and overwhelm and processing stuff and what's it been like yeah i think in terms of the healing curve um you, you know we're all 
we're all in different places um, in our adoption journey and there's no wrong, there's no right. Um, we're all just experiencing different things at different times. And I think for me, just, you know, being on that point of the healing curve where I have acceptance that I'm not going to get all of the answers uh, that I may want. Um, I just have that kind of sense of peace about everything, just about the circumstances around my adoption, around my relationships, about adoption in general. And, you know, I think that's just where I'm at in the healing curve. And, uh, you know, I, I feel, I feel fortunate to, you know, have, had the experiences that I've had and and also that I've been able to reconnect with my birth family and it's been a positive experience. Yeah. Yeah, when I, we've done a, I've done a few interviews with uh, birth mothers recently uh, for the for the podcast. Um and it it always those conversations are all re always really beautiful because they remind me of I think I've done three now actually three for the podcast and and you know we talk i talked to most people before do the podcast with them so i must have had six at least six conversations with uh with birth mothers more than that now um and it always takes me to a a, a place of peace i'm not sure peace as well it it takes me back, reminds me of my birth mother's love for me, which I only got a, um, a glimpse of in a letter, you know? Uh, I, it was that she, she died a long time before I went, uh, went searching. Um, and yet that letter was an, enough of an insight into how difficult it was for her and how to to give me the empathy for her to realize that how tricky it had been for her, how it the plan had been made a long time before I'd come along, right? So it the it wasn't like she gave birth to me and then thought, I don't like this one, you know. She um she had had that plan in her head and that had clearly been tough. And every conversation I have with a birth mother, or even a conversation with you about your birth mother, kind of takes me to that, mm -hmm. to that place where we're, we're, we're sinking into, um, uh, uh, we're sinking into our hearts. We're no longer over revved in our heads and we're not, fearful of that rejection we're not thinking that there's something wrong with us exactly it's, it's there's trying something to very special it. sorry yes no i'm sorry i was just saying yes there's something just a level of understanding that you try to reach i think and and putting yourself in their position uh and taking it away from just what you're experiencing and what you're feeling and, you know, I was really just trying to understand, you know, what her life was like, what it was like for her to yeah. make that type of decision and, and live with that type of decision. Uh, and, you know, she told me she's, she's regretted it ever since she made the decision and, and living with that, um, living with that burden. But every time I speak to her, I, I, all I think is that this is just a beautiful person. Like she's a kind hearted person and, um, yeah, I have no no ill feelings towards her. It's um, I was talking, you know, talk, when I talked to adoptees about their adopted parents or their birth parents, you know, and there's this sometimes there's a, um, a, 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 an anger there, um, and, and and people will say, well, it's 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 justifiable anger." But like the, I was talking to a mentor of mine a couple of weeks ago, and she said, "Well, I think some the Buddha or somebody said 
there's no such thing as justifiable anger. It's well, and it's like it's like um, she came up with a great metaphor. It's it, it, it it's like punching ourselves in the head, <laughs> and, and 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 then blaming somebody else for the back for the for the black eye. No, it's, it doesn't do us any any good whatsoever. The the acceptance brings peace um, in a way that anger just doesn't. Anger just continues our suffering, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think it just goes back to the healing curve, right? Everybody's in a different place and, you know, they're entitled to their feelings and, you know, everybody's circumstances are different. I mean, they're, you know, just because they were adopted doesn't mean that their life turned out for the better, right? They could, they could have, uh, they could have gotten in a, a in a worse situation. Um, everybody's story is different and their feelings are uh, justifiable to, you know, they're allowed to feel how they feel. There's nothing wrong with that. I think just for me personally, I have, um, I've just kind of reached that level of acceptance and, and peace, like you said, and I don't, I don't have any anger. Beautiful. Is, is there anything else that you'd like to share that I've not asked you about? You know, I, I, I just, I love being able to have these conversations uh, with people and it's always, it's always a pleasure to connect with other adoptees and continue to learn about different perspectives. I think it's just always important that we continue to support one another um, and be there for one another. I really have, I love to see this really supportive adoption community and it's great to be a part of it. Um, so I think we need to just keep yeah. raising each other, lifting each other up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Yael. And uh, as always, listeners, check out the uh, the show notes for links to, uh, to Yale's site and social media and the, and the, and the book. And um, thank you for, for sharing the time with us this afternoon. Yeah, it's been great to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. It was great speaking with you, Simon. Thanks, listeners. We'll speak to you very soon. Cheers. Bye-bye.